Yeah. And so we're, we're here to, to talk about that. We've got kind of a holistic approach um, and that we're going to try out a little bit with our normal school um, discussion. So um, I would encourage you to ask questions as we get along the way. If I start talking too fast or um, if you need clarification, just, just yell and see if I don't see you. So um, we're going to take a three legged stool uh, approach um, and look at what is school. So there's, uh, there's three, three categories of, of um, science that we really look at when we're talking about soils. And if you, if you um, have a science background at university, or you start talking to a physicist, a chemist, and a biologist, they're all going to have an argument as to why their discipline is the foundation of everything, and why it's the most important, and nobody could do anything without them. Um, I'm a biologist, so I just have an argument with, with these people. <laughs> but um, I, I think that physicists have a, have a good argument. Um, it, it, it really nothing else works without getting a good start in that. With physics and soil, we're talking primarily about aeration, um, aggregation of soil particles, and water retention, also drainage. So how well how well does your, does your soil handle water? With chemistry, we're talking about the Cation exchange is happy. Don't worry, we're not going to get too in depth in that. But that's a little bit about how well your soil um, makes nutrients available to plants. Um, pH, also along those lines, is all about nutrients when you're talking about chemistry. Um, acidity versus alkalinity in, in those available nutrients. On the biology side, we're going to talk about all the critters that are in the soil, as well as organic matter. So one more time just to look at those points. The thing I'll point out, organic matter is going to come up over and over and over and over again. Um, it's going to be a big part of the structure of the soil. It's going to be a big part in how it's going to play a part in how the chemistry of the soil and, and how um, and nutrient availability. And of course, it's going to make a big difference in, in the life of the soil and what um, well, what's added to it, it was all, you know, at least once living, if it's not living now. So, um, in balance, a perfect ideal of a, a soil is going to have a 33% a, a of each of these components. When you get one off, off kilter, that's when you start to have some soil problems. Um, if you, and it's generally not going to be that you have too much life in your soil, it's generally going to be that you you have over over fertilized, if you have some taxing issues, if the physical attributes are giving you an issue, that you have uh, a texture that's not working for your needs. And when we talk about good soil, it's, it's good to clarify, we're talking about the ideal garden soil, farming soil, things that are, you know, the soil are, are different all over the world, and they are what they are, and they grow what they grow. Um, but we're talking about an ideal garden soil, so something that's really rich and, and Dark and pretty. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that means. But, um, so, one more illustration about those three properties. Over here on the right, we've got um, physical soil properties how it holds on the water, how the air available in these spaces, um, what the actual soil, soil particles look like. On um, the chemical side, we're talking about the actual um, nutrients, the elements that are available, um, and little bits of organic matter, how they uh, interact with the other chemical parts, and then the biological parts. I'm going to talk about it over and over and over again, but I um, want to have as many illustrations to get the point across as possible. So we've got lots of fungi holding things together. We've got little nematodes, both beneficial and, and uh, parasitic. We've got little protists down here, little microscopic squishy things, um, and we've got all kinds of bacteria, mice, insects, mold, what have you. So physics is what we're going to start with here. Um, there's three different types, and three primary um, components of your soil. And it's going to be based on what the parent material is. We talk about sand, of course, it's most coarse, silt, and clay. Um, over here, back, this is this is um, trying to show you the uh, the size of each type of particle relative to one another. And you've got the large sand in the yellow. You've got the medium grade sand in green. Fine sand is blue, and it, got this, it goes way down to the red and silt. And clay, believe me, there is a dot right there. It's just, it's just tiny. So um, it really makes a big difference. That's, that's an individual particle of, of clay versus, you know, you can see sand. Silt, you, you can see 
get this in free tough play. It's just, it's just incredibly tiny. If you ever try to get play off your boots, um, you know how how um, how hard it is to separate from one another. It's just tiny stuff and sticky to. Um, there's nothing you're going to be able to do about the mineral, the, the actual mineral components of your soil, short of sort of taking it out and putting it back with something else. So we just want to talk about the things that we do have control. Um, one thing you'll, you'll see in the book, uh, I want to point this out, this is the traditional um, soil texture diagram, and, uh, and it, it's pretty self-explanatory, I hope, but you can tell the, the basic um, texture of your soil, whether it's in these categories, it's clay loam or silty loam, loamy sand, these are what you're going to see in a, a, a soil um, Oh, what do you call it? The soil report of, of your, your property or of, of the county, you look at those, those maps. So, based on the percentage of, of clay, silt, and sand, you'll get that category. I don't expect most people use this on a regular basis, but it's good that you're familiar with it and know the, the background behind it. So, Warren talked about some of these, some of these tests that I'm going to talk about. Um, and that is, I made sure that I, some of them weren't in there until he promised that I would talk about them, so I want to make sure to get them. Um, one way out, that short of, of, a, of a, um, a, a more quantitative uh, way to tell your soil, this is, a, this is a field test that works well. It's based just on how it feels. Sand is pretty, um, silt is smooth, and, and clay is sticky. So this, that's just rubbing it through your, your hand. Um, Another way is the ball squeeze test. When you're when you're holding when you're holding soil, um, squeeze it really tight. Get it get it wet. Squeeze it really tight. If it's sandy, it's not going to really care. It's going to start falling through your hand. It's going to going to break open a little bit. Um, and if it's uh, let's see how I go here. Um, if you if you've got a medium texture, you're going to be able to dent it and and break it apart fairly easily. If it's fine texture, it's going to you know it's like clay. It's like when you work with clay pottery, it's going to be rigid and, and clay-like. So. All these things, they sound, they sound intuitive, but um, you don't think about applying them to soil in the field. Okay, so this is the test that, that uh, Dr. Anderson mentioned, the ribbon test. And this is actually taking the soil and, and rubbing it through your fingers, and it's, you're judging on how long of a ribbon you can get. The shorter a ribbon, the, the more coarse grained your material is because it's not gonna it's not gonna stick together and maintain a long ribbon. So um, I don't have to go through all of these, but that's another reason why you've got these. Um, if it's if it's uh, short, it's it these various degrees of, of sandy. Um, and if it if it starts to break off at one or two inches, it's gonna be a medium texture, more of a silty um, soil, and then if it's over two inches, you're gonna have a clay soil. And it doesn't take a lot of clay to become a clay soil. Uh, as little as 20%, it can it can act like a clay soil because it it has such fine properties. So um, here in this area, what most of you probably know about some clay soils. Um, they're not the worst they could be, believe it or not, but they they uh, you, you know about water loss and uh, impenetrable soils most likely. I want to show a picture of of what a clay molecule looks like. This is clay like clay. This is not what we actually have here, but it's, it's pretty pretty representative. This is show how little space there is for for water, for air, um, and how so how clay is it, clay is a builder's dream because it compacts so easily. It just it just smashes. There's not a lot of little nooks and crannies and caves in there to to hide water and air and, and Anything but clay, you know, <laughs> stick together. So again, there's nothing you can do to change the mineral composition of your soil. So we're going to look at some of the things you can look at. The organic material. Um, ideal soil is going to have a 25% water and 25% air ratio. Um, the rest is going to be composed of that mineral component, the the uh, parent material. I'm sorry, it's 45% is, and the remaining 5%, which is actually pretty covered soil. Five percent organic material is, is pretty good looking soil if you if you get your soil analyzed. What that's made of is um, is primarily three different different types. So living organisms composed 
about 10% of that 5%. And again, that's your earthworms and your centipedes and your, uh, your voles and all that good stuff. Um, the actual roots of growing plant material. And if you're lucky, about 80% humans. And so, they all know what the humans is, you can buy it in a bag. It's, it's the really rotted, well composted material. There's nothing that's all that identifiable in that. It shouldn't be. Um, and it has some pretty neat properties that help us on. This is another way to look at it uh, as far as uh, ideal soil, clay soil, and sanding soil. Um, you've got this, this nice balance here with optimal soil. With clay soil, you're going to have um, a, a greater water to air ratio. And in sanding soil, you're going to have more air. So the, the, your clay soils won't drain, and your sanding soils won't hold on to anything, in other words. So bulk density. Um, I don't have to read all this bit, but um, bulk density is, is a, has got some images that will represent it. It's, it's a matter of how, how heavy your soil is, how dense your soil particles are, how much space there is for, for the organic material, for the water, for the air, for all these things. Um, and uh, this is an illustration of just what that would look like. So when you, you bring in this, this idea of aggregate, with low bulk density, and that's a good thing, um, you're going to have less weight in the overall volume of soil. You're going to have more pore space for, for this air, for these water molecules to bind onto the soil, for all the little critters to run around in here. And you're going to have soil that wants to clump together. That's going to be a, a good identifier of, of healthy, good soil. Um, with, uh, with high bulk density, there's no room for all the extra stuff. It's just going to be compacted. Um, it's not it, when it, this soil and this soil are on, in side by side fields, and you get a you get a good rain. You have plants out there; they dry up. Which soil is going to be able to sustain those plants longer? It's the one with all the space, so that it has the water and nutrients in it. So, so what affects those is this term called aggregation, and that's how your, your soil particles bind to one another. Um, what affects aggregation? I'm going to step through these. Uh, first of all, it's going to depend on, on what your parent material is. Um, it's going to depend on the actual sand, silk, or clay. Um, how much organic matter content is going to matter a lot. Um, how often you kill. Um, what type of machinery you use. Um, how when you kill, as far as if you turn your soil to fill, that's all kinds of things. When you work your soil, if it's wet, if it's cold, if it's too dry, those are all things that can affect soil, um, soil culture. And uh, soil biology plays a huge part. There's lots of dump in living things that when you put it in soil, it does, it does magical, has magical properties and it, and it sticks to things. Um, the fungal matter that's in soil, all those little strands of white hyphen when you pull up the mulch, those in soil, they, they act as sort of a glue for all those aggregates. Um, and and the, the roots as well um, affect aggregation. One more diagram of that, of those single grains of, of core aggregation in these, these nice kind of bright like a popcorn ball type um, clusters of, of well aggregated soil. So what is it that does this aggregation? We talked about the different the different um, the different things that affect it. Um, mainly it is all that life. So we've got we've got this microbial glue, so all the ick and stuff that comes kind of this very technical term it, um, that comes from um, all the little, the little creatures. We've got lots of their waste. We've got um, we've got um, well, it's, it's primarily waste and just natural sticks from those things. Uh, fungal hyphen have this really neat component that I hope I can get through these slides fast enough to tell you about because you'll find out. I love fungi, um, and they have this this uh, protein material that comes off of their hyphen that that is thought to be one of the main carbon sources in our soils because it, it holds these aggregates so well together. Um, so that's, what, that's what's doing it primarily. So what do you take care of? You take care of the organic part of your soil. So what, what 
what is good about aggregation? With the increased aggregation, you get more water coming into your soils. You can get water, you can get, um, with really fine, unaggregated, non-aggregated soils, the water can just sheet off. You can get even kind of a salty crust on there. The water just doesn't penetrate as well as if, as if you've got loose, um, loose, healthy soils that you get with good aggregation. Again, that soil crusting, you know, if you have less aggregation, you're not going to have a lot of that. Here, the water's going to go in, so it's not going to take the soil away with it. So you're going to have less, less soil erosion. And you're going to have more water available to your crop, just like that diagram that shows you with the big circles and lots of space in there. So it's going to make a difference. So again, we increase our aggregations with increasing organic matter in our soils. Um, being careful to, to till at the right time to, um, to avoid compaction. So a little bit about tillage. I can't remember if I get to this later. Um, bear with me. This is a new presentation. So I'm learning it a little bit myself. But um, with tillage, if you if you work your soils when it's when it's really wet, that what does what does that do to your soil? At any time when you overwork your soil, period, you're going to be when you work your soil, period, you're going to be doing a little bit of damage to to whatever's living in there, right? You're going to cut earthworms in half. You're going to cut those spines from the high feet in half. You're going to break through those aggregates. This is kind of a price to do in business, but you want to minimize how often you do that. And you work it when it's wet, it's you're, you're, you're squishing the water out of it. You're squishing the airspace. You're, you're causing it to compact and get tighter. And the same thing, a little bit different way, can work when, it's, when the soil is really dry. You're pulverizing the soil. You're taking what, what little bit of moisture might have been clinging on to the moisture, to the soil particles. You can't see that sort of moisture, but or the little bit of air space that was that was in the structure of the soil. You're just taking and pulverizing it, just like when you run powdered sugar through a through a sister. You're just making it as, as smooth as possible. So both too wet and too dry can do some very difficult to, to reverse soil damage. So. Um, we keep talking about what, what good soil and bad soil looks like. What is the line and even between what is the relevant pressure type data? How would you be judging the wind in the I think I've got a slide on that. She asked, how do you judge too wet or too dry? And, and it's going to be, there, there, there's some basic tests on that. And again, it's another, another screening test. If you can, if you can you take a, a bit of soil and you, you squeeze it and you get water out of it. That's too wet. If you can squeeze it and it kind of stays in its form, but it crumbles fairly easy. That's perfect. If you if you squeeze it and it just either if it's rock, you just rock water that we get in July, you know that's too dry. Or if you if it if there's nothing to squeeze, if it's just hard, it's going to be too dry. Uh, there's this nice in between, but it's actually workable. You still have a little bit of moisture to it. Wow. Learn that, but, but if you can get moisture from it, it's too wet. So this, uh, this, is, this is what we're going to call the, the unhealthy soil, um, and this is what we're going to call a good-looking soil. So the characteristics of this, what are some things that point out from what you, you hear so far that make you think really dense, right? Lots of clay, which means there's not much air space. There's there's not much water space. There's not there's not a lot of critters running through it. There's not a lot of holes and, and cavities in here. Over here, it's dark, so you can't see as well. But there are there there's channels in here. Um, it's dark. It's rich. Dark clearly means there's a lot of good airflow and, and nutrients in there. Um, it just looks like good soil. A lot of people will just call this yummy soil. It's, it's, it's like cake. So uh, that's what you're. That's what the idea is, and most of us aren't going to quite get there, depending on what our parent material is. But um, shooting for something over here is, is a nice, a nice in between um, loose and soil. So how do we avoid compaction? Compaction is a, is a big detriment to to soil aggregation, to drainage, to good drainage. Um, and we avoid walking in our plant bed. Um, 
use anything you've got to, to give a designated area to spread out that waste zone. Um, you can use uh, planks. I think it's a really nice um, railroad tie walk through some through gardens. Um, gravel, covered fabric, really thick mulch. This is a, an idea I've seen some places, and you can do it myself. Not only are you are you mulching your walkway, but when you when you mow over your yard a whole lot, well, as we do once a week or more during the, the good growing season, we're just compacting that that soil over and over and over again. It's not a huge piece of equipment, but it's enough that it makes a difference. So. All these plants over here, even if the, the grass is right here, they're still affected by whatever is, you know, a few feet away from them. So if you increase the area that the, the water can permeate better, you're gonna you're gonna improve your your overall um, water capacity. So again, don't work wet soil. This is what I was talking about. Practice this is a ball test. Um, that's a good, that's a good description of what you want it to look like. You want to have some. You want to be able to break it apart some. Uh, you want to crumple a little bit and still have some moisture. Um, so like the, the half of plants um, that are deep rooted and uh, and help to break the soil up some. And don't ever let your, your soils go bare. We underestimate a lot how the, the power of, of rain is, and that it that it really does cause all that runoff, that it really does move that much soil with erosion. It also causes a lot of compaction. There's a lot of energy in all that rain. Um, and it, it, can, it can make a big difference in, in whether or not you have a layer of straw over your garden over the winter. Of course, the cover crop would be lovely. But, um, or if you just had it fair, not only are you going to lose some soil, you're going to lose the amendments you put in there, some of them. Um, and you're also going to actually have some compaction as a result of having those air soil. Some more ways. Um, soils can be looser than ever in, in late winter, early spring because of the spring, the, the spring freeze thaw effect. Whenever you've got saturated soils that freeze, all that air, all that water expands and creates these spaces once it thaws and loosens soil up. It's not going to help with really long term deep compaction, but it, it can help for, for you know, some light walking paths, that sort of thing. Um, Aerate the soil. A lot of you are probably familiar with lawn aerators and actually just punch, punching holes and removing some thatch and doing all that at once. And then the soil. Just again adding organic material. Compost, compost, compost. You're going to not only improve the soil structure, reduce compaction, but you're also going to make a much friendlier environment for your, for your living critters and invite new ones to come in. And use the appropriate equipment for the job. Um, there are so many different options for what you need to do. Um, there's no reason to bring out your, your big tractor for a 30 by 30 garden, um, unless that's the only thing you've got. But if, there's probably another tool out there. You can borrow something if you, if you only have a 30 by 30 garden. I'm wondering why you have a tractor. But um, you use what's appropriate to take care to take the care of your soil. I'm not sure I'd really recommend planting a bed or whatever she's doing around this tree, but doesn't make a difference to any of us. We all have the, this little bitty guy right here. Those things are wonderful little pillars. You can take them anywhere. They really can. And they're one of the most consistent engines to start that starts at my house. <laughs> Everything else I have to work with and, and cut that and, and kick. And, but the man almost always starts up if, if, uh, if I don't have the ethanol damage in my lawn. But that's really nice. These are these neat frost works that are really handy for small amounts of ground. Um, I wouldn't do that with, with my kids. Um, but but it, they're, they're fun. And they actually do an amazing amount of work uh, with less effort than you can imagine. Okay, I'm going to speed up just a little bit. Um, this, is, this is more about the, the, the different parts of organic material. Um, we think of them as the living, the dead, and the very, very dead. So the living are all the things that are actually, you know, Respirating in some way or another, or actually still green and, and living as a plant. Um, the the uh, fresh residue is going to be, you know, grass clippings that you just put in, um, leaves from last fall, things that still look like what they started as. Um, and then we also have the the that's going to be the actively decomposing as well, and the fresh.
pressurized gas. Pressurized gas is going to be long flipping from last week, actively decomposing with the uh, leaves from October. Stable humus is going to be things that are unrecognizable, that are actually actively making nutrients available to your plants. They're, they're already broken down enough that they're, they finish their part and they're, they're feeding your plant at this point. So you want a combination of all these stages in your soils that you've got. These guys, this is kind of your investment for the future. And you've got, you've got this that's you know waiting in the wings, We're getting ready for retirement, and these are, are what's actually paying you right now. So just a, a little bit about humus. Um, I'm going to really speed up some, but humus increases your water holding capacity. It increases that, that CEC, your cation exchange component, which I'm just going to touch on. Um, your tilt, is tilt the word that y'all are familiar with? Someone else asked me, what is tilt? Tilt is kind of, I'm not sure there's a proper definition, but it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's just a feeling you have. Tilt is, is, is good textured soil. Tilt is a description of soil texture in a way. You have good tilt if it, if it is well aggregated, if there's air, if it's good soil, you have good tilt. It's, it's a, it's a, that's the best way I can say it without looking it up, but it's just, it's a, it's a feeling of how soil you have. Um, you're going to increase drainage, um, reduce your bulk density, reduce your erosion with great humus, and increase your nutrient levels. So we're moving on to the chemistry. Okay, I don't expect you to read this, but I wanted to make it available for the geeks out there who might be interested in this. Humus is, is so neat because it um, is very negatively charged, and greater amounts of humus in your soil are actually going to attract a lot of the, the elemental nutrients that we need that are positively charged, like calcium, like sulfur, like magnesium. Um, it's, that's, that's a big benefit of, of humus. There's all the humic acids. There's all these different types uh, of humic acids that can be released from this degraded plant material, but um, just wanted to point that out. Um, there's a lot of chemistry going on in this world that you didn't know about. Um, so, so this is cation exchange capacity. This is the amount of negative charge that exists in humans and clays. Clays are also negatively charged, and it allows them to hold on to those positively charged chemicals. Um, this, this, I think that's a really equivalent. It doesn't sound important that you know really that conversion, but the number you're looking for, if you ever have your CEC potential um, looked at, is going to be somewhere between 10 and 30. The, Seems like it may not be relevant to you. A lot of people look at their CEC when they're working in greenhouses, when they have uh, non-soil-based potting mixes. And they have poinsettias, pansies, mums, things that need to show nutrient turnaround really quickly. Does that make sense? Things that you need, you need immediate impact from your fertilizer. So you want to make sure they're as available as possible. If you have a, a boron deficiency, if you have some deficiency or toxicity, you want to know what your cation exchange capacity is so that you. You can tell that maybe it's, it's something you can could, you could adjust. So can we change this? It's, it's, well, I should have said that, but pH is the main thing. Um, pH is going to strongly affect how available your nutrients are. Um, if you increase the organic material, um, you can, you can uh, positively affect your, your CEC. So this is this is a good illustration of what pH will do for your for your um, nutrient availability. You have all of these um, important nutrients that are that are um, required for good plant growth. And see, I thought I had a forgive me if I skip forward. Looks like I skipped a slide. So soil pH it literally stands for the power of hydrogen. It's a measure of how much hydrogen. It, um, Availability of the molecule has. I might not be correct, correct exact on that, but it does stand for power of hydrogen, so you can at least make your friends with that. Um, the a range from 0 to 14. 0 being more acid, being um, more, some people call sour soils, lower on the, on the pH scale, um, and it's, it's low, low pH equals high acid. If you go toward 14, you're talking about more of the basic soils, alkaline soils. Uh, most of what we have around here is going to be on the alkaline, slightly alkaline to neutral side. Um, I say
say that because my story is is strongly is close. 